All right. All right. Welcome back to 2023. And to start the year off, we are talking to a series of Penang based founders. While many of you may know Penang as the home of one of the big hubs of semiconductors, there is now a growing and burgeoning software market and a bigger, bigger tech scene than most people realize. And so today I have Howie Chang, the founder of Forward School. And for those of you who don't know, Forward Forward School is equipping the aspiring students and tech professionals with industry-ready skills, ready for the fast-moving tech sector. All right. Thank you very much for being here, Howie. Yep. Uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be part of your show. Very cool. So take me back to the beginning. How did you start your entrepreneurial journey in the first place? And what led you to want to launch Forward School? Sure. I, I think I've caught the bug uh, when I was uh, working in uh, Singapore. So just a bit of a background. I'm a, I'm a Penangite, uh, but I left for Singapore after uh, from five, after my high school uh, education here. Um, and I left Singapore for my tertiary education. Um, and I've been there since, um, you know, I've been there for almost 18, 19 years. Uh, before deciding to be back in Penang around five years ago. So while while I was in Singapore, obviously, um, my experience has been largely uh, software application engineering. That's my background, software engineering. Um, but I have a passion in design, so UI, UX. Uh, so while in Singapore, I've uh, long story short, um, uh, I've, I've only worked for one MNC, uh, the rest are all startups. So I, I love the startup journey. And I've had the opportunity uh, to be part of startups um, of all sizes. And notably, I was with uh, Vicky.com um, as well as Redmart.com. Um, obviously, I wasn't the founder, but I was um, uh, considered an early employee. So I, I've, 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 I guess I've... Uh, caught the buck um, from those two founders, um, especially from uh, Razmik from Vicky.com. I've learned so much uh, from him. And I think it remains one of the biggest acquisition in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Okay. Quite different, the, the experience at the MNC versus the startup uh, that you worked at, I, I imagine. You you generally have to wear multiple hats, doing quite a lot, and, and often doing fire drills where things have a lot more urgency. Yeah, yes, yes, uh, definitely. So, but I, I've realized that, you know, at the heart of it, I'm, I'm someone who just love uh, pioneering work. Um, and, and, you know, in an MNC, uh, most of the time, uh, the cocks are all sort of in place. Mm. Uh, the flywheel has already been figured out. And your job is to, you know, keep the cocks going as well as the flywheel going. But I think in a startup, uh, you know, environment, uh, you know, most of the time, there's no cocks, there's no flywheel, and it's your job to figure it out. And I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's an analogy, and I can't remember who to give credit for it, but it, it's it's something along the lines of b building a startup is like jumping off a cliff and then trying to assemble the airplane yeah. on your way down. Very, uh, apt. yeah, very. Apt. <laughs> so, th so then you got you got the entrepreneurial bug while you were in Singapore, but then yeah. what what led you to want to launch Forward School? What is it about the education uh, segment that yeah. that inspired you? Yeah. So, um, you know, Forward School is uh, inspired by my own uh, tertiary education path uh, that I've that I've taken. So um, after high school, very naturally, you know, um, there's a few paths that normally people will take. Um, one is obviously you will go on to your form six or E levels um, and then to university. Um, and then the other path is, um, you know, there's, 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 uh, it's, it's not so favored upon. Uh, so when, when I was offered to be in Singapore to further my education, actually, I was offered to do my A, A levels, uh, in a junior college in, in Singapore, but against, um, you know, um, against convention or against, 
uh, um, um, expectations, I, I, I rejected that offer and I, I wrote myself into Nanyang Polytechnic. Mm. Uh, so at that point of time, uh, you know, it is, it is, I wouldn't say frowned upon, but there's some a stigma that comes along with it. You know, uh, you can't study. That's why, you know, um, you are enrolling into uh, a polytechnic. Um, so, so obviously for me, I, I've, I've always been inspired by that education uh, model uh, whereby it is very close to the industry. And I think at that point of time, I was just very clear in terms of uh, the type of learner that I am as well as uh, the drive that I have that I wanted to uh, be very close to the industry and be in the, the industry uh, as fast as possible. And I think the uh, polytechnic education path allows me to do that. And that sort of uh, inspired me, um, you know, for forward school. Um, I think, you know, in the end of the day, the traditional um, education system is ripe for uh, some level of disruption. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be improvements made. And, and for us here at Forward School, uh, we believe that, you know, uh, uh, the world is going to be driven by uh, makers and creators. And especially in the tech industry, whereby things move so quickly, uh, there needs to be a way whereby we are able to do that and change more quickly as to fit into the industry and what they expect of us. Okay. Okay. So, so, okay. So you, I, I, I get the, get the journey, get the, get the understanding on, on your own educational experience. So then when you decide upon going after the education segment, I think most people in, regardless of industry, and this is kind of a global issue, real we have the similar sort of complaint that students aren't graduating with, the skills to be functional on day one there's a lot of operation required yeah. and so you know technical schools certainly these the polytech something that's closer to the industry has 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 an appeal when you get the idea how do you start in regards to building it because now now you got to develop a curriculum you got to get close to industry what were those first few steps for you yeah. So obviously, when we first started, uh, we have to be very clear in in regards to our positioning and direction. Uh, so in the in the industry in the space that we are in right now, uh, you will see a lot of uh what we call boot camp schools, mm -hmm. um, um, and and these are basically you know the general assemblies and uh so and so forth. Uh, but I think for us, we have taken a position that. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, because of the audience that we uh, would like to serve, um, accreditation uh, is important to us. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we see ourselves, we are an accredited uh, school under the uh, Ministry of Human Resource, uh, specifically under the Skills Department. Okay. Uh, and the reason why uh, we feel that this it's an important step to make a decision on because that will dictate the things that we do um, because we're going to be putting some focus on it in, in regards to accreditation. And it is not easy, but uh, we do see it as a level of mode, uh, a strong mode as well. Um, um, so we are not a bootcamp school in regards, you know, in, in terms of a three months, six months, and then place you. Mm -hmm. Although I must say that we do that for um, uh, adults, we do that for lane changes, people who want to switch careers, but they have been in the industry for a good number of years. That is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, but for high school leavers, uh, we still am convinced that uh, at this point in time, um, you know, with 90% and above of the companies are still paying people based on accreditation. That's the reality on the ground. Yeah. Uh, it will not be fair for us, right? Uh, to tell the students that uh, um actually the paper is not important. It is important, especially to the audience that we are serving, which uh, a lot of them are the underserved community. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's you know one of the things that we have to kind of sort of figure out. 
And then we went on to um, yeah, acquire or get uh, go through the process of our accreditation. Mm -hmm. um, and with the with the process for that accreditation, you know, did you already have to have a standing curriculum? What what are what are some of the requirements and some of the challenges, I guess, that you faced in that pathway to accreditation? Yeah, in any accreditation, it is tough. Uh, because there's a there's a certain level of expectation in terms of the process, uh, and it is stringent. Um, and we decided to go with the Ministry of Human Resource as opposed to Ministry of Education. Is really because uh, uh, in terms of what we want to do, uh, the Ministry of uh, Human Resource is 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 I would I would say that it is much more aligned. Um, and we have our own syllabus. It is uh, basically uh, created uh, in-house. Um, we have full-time uh, instructors uh, as well as, um, you know, uh, learning designers. Mm -hmm. um, so once we have the syllabus, um, actually, we took, we took a look at what uh, the Ministry of Human Resource have as an accreditation body. Uh, they call it the NOS, the National Occupancy Standard Syllabus. Mm -hmm. um, and we found out that, hey, there's, there's no such offering. Um, and so together with MDAC, and I must uh, thank MDAC here uh, that lends uh, their support to us. Uh, we actually approached uh, JP, uh, we, JPK, which is the Jabatan uh, Pembangunan Kemahiran, the Skills Department under the Ministry of Human Resource, so we pitched to them that there's a need for a new uh, standard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and long story short, uh, we work with, you know, JPK uh, in regards to uh, creating a new NOS based on the forward school uh, syllabus. Okay. Okay. And in, in sourcing the instructors as well, because, you know, when you're, when you're building out, these sorts of programs it's it's quite important to have you know instructors with these skill sets did you have any issues in being able to source quality talents in order to be able to facilitate this yeah i think i think the advantage that we have is you know my background is in software engineering mm -hmm. um, you know and our early our basically our other founders um, and leadership comes from the industry so it is very different when we hire for instructors, uh, we speak their language. Um, and so as much as possible, we do see ourselves more um, like, you know, tech people, a tech company that happens to just be very passionate in solving the education, uh, you know, in the education space, happens to be an education space. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that really differentiates us and that really allows us to attract, um, you know, people, uh, that are like-minded uh, people from the industry. So when they are joining, they are not necessarily joining, you know, an academic institution in the right. sense, uh, but we are very much all about technology as well. Okay. Um, so obviously, you know, attracting talents is, you know, that I don't think it, it, it matters if in which industry that you're in, uh, it's always um, uh, challenged. Um, and and I think that's where you know our vision and our mission comes in. Okay, okay. And so in the early days, were you actually teaching yourself uh, and and perhaps your co-founders as well? Uh, yes. Um, I, in fact, I am uh, still teaching in in some of the supplementary uh, modules. Uh, and I think I think I loved uh, teaching. I was actually an adjunct uh, lecturer while I was working uh, in, in Singapore uh, with, you know, um, Singapore Polytechnic as well as Republic Polytechnic. So, mm -hmm. so I still enjoy teaching. So once in a while, uh, the team would uh, include me uh, for some of the supplementary modules. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, so then let's, let's, let's talk about the, the, the specific modules and that. So when you're getting industry specific, how, how are they defined? Are they sequential? Are there different tracks? How do you end up developing this, this program? Yeah. So we, we pretty much developed it from, you know, scratched. Um, I think when we started this, uh, it's really from the perspective of people from the industry and what they need 
and what we feel it is important for students to uh you know the skills for them to be to acquire uh and so in regards to you know we call it the nitro degree in applied software engineering uh in the end of the day it covers uh softwares that's for sure um and uh, in terms of two, three main parts, uh, which is the web applications, and that we cover front end and back end, um, and then mobile application. For that, we kind of teach Android development. Um, and then we have our data science as well, uh, which we think it's going to be extremely important for the students to you know, understand um, um, in regards to the entire process of mm -hmm. uh, preparing the data, and then cleaning the data and then making sure that they are able to be digested and putting it into a model, a machine learning model. Mm -hmm. So uh, so in two years, uh, we believe that the students will be, at the very least, the foundations will be uh, very stable uh, for them to uh, contribute directly to any companies that they have joined. Um, so, so that's how it is being structured. Um, uh, in regards to web applications, mobile applications, uh, data science. Uh, of course, we have other supplementary modules that comes along with it. Uh, for example, like uh, software project management um, mm -hmm. and then preparing them for interviews and so on and so forth. Okay, okay. And how how, how do you come up with, uh, if, if you were to introduce a new module, what's what's the process that you go through in order to introduce something new? Yeah. So in regards to our syllabus, what we have ensured is that uh, we do not uh, place in the specific language that we use. Um, I think that is important for us to do mm -hmm. uh, so that we can uh, change or switch out uh, the language uh, anytime that, uh, that we want. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have taken on that approach. So uh, the framework still remains, the structure still remains, uh, but we are free to, you know, swap out. For example, oh, um, uh, we do cover PHP as well because that's what the industry sure. really needs. Um, but, you know, if we feel, for example, like, you know, in the next year, uh, that's no longer the case, uh, we can switch it out anytime. Uh, right. So it's, it's, it's unlike uh, traditional... Um, education institution um, whereby it takes a longer time. And that's one of the reasons why we are aligning ourselves to Ministry of Human Resource as well. Okay. 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 Interesting. Interesting. So if if I if I was a, an, an aspiring tech professional and I'm looking at uh, uh, skilling myself up, how is the pro how is the program set up? Is it is it flexible? Are there specific modules? Is it kind of self serve to where I want to learn this skill, but maybe not the others? How how is the selection for the the, the potential students? I think at this point in time, uh, we do have our physical boot camps. Um, uh, I stand corrected; it is not physical, but it's done online. But it mm. is online live. Mm. Uh, that's the mode that we have been offering uh, for lane changes for uh, working adults that's looking to pick up a new skill. And at this point in time, uh, we are very much focused uh, in data science mm -hmm. um, as well as uh, deep learning. Um, and, 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 and in regards to our other boot camps, at this point in time, in terms of enterprise courses, I think we have around 22 uh, different short courses and programs, uh, which we do not publish it publicly. Mm -hmm. um, now, these are primarily uh, courses that we uh, sell to the enterprises uh, okay. for workforce upskilling. So in regards of our positioning, I think... Uh, we will be moving more and more towards enterprise mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to uh, public boot camps. Okay. And for the enterprise clients, because you're uh, because you're registered with the human resource uh, uh, department, does that qualify the expense under 
you know, most companies in Malaysia, they have to dedicate a certain amount of money each year towards human resource development. Your programs qualify for that that expense. So essentially, there's a tax benefit for the enterprise, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So we are a uh, HRD Corp uh, approved training center. Mm -hmm. So all of our enterprise programs are claimable from the HRD Corp. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, cool. So, so let, let me let me ask you a few more questions on this because one one of the things that I that I read on your website is this thing about the income share agreement. And so you talked about get, get serving the underserved segments of the market. So yeah. tell me how you how you came to the idea of the income share agreement and maybe what is an income share agreement. Yeah. So yeah, this is very interesting, and uh, yeah, w- would love to share. Uh, what we have learned, um, as well as our decision on it as well. So when when we start offering uh, ISA or income share agreement, it's actually popularized uh, fr- uh, in the in the in the West, uh, in the US specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some schools that popularize uh, this model, um, and 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 uh, we sort of when we first started, uh, we learned very much about it. Uh, we did quite uh, an extensive, um, you know, financial modeling on it as well. Um, and we decided to offer it. Uh, but I must say that at the point of offering, uh, the intention uh, has never been to have ISA uh, uh, to be our main um, uh, model. Uh, it has always been more towards a marketing play for us. Okay. Um, as, a, as a new school, I think it is important for us to uh, attract a certain level of uh, eyeballs. And we feel that the ISA can do that for us. And uh, it is a learning phase for us as well. Mm-hmm. So we did offer it. And in fact, as of today, uh, we are still offering it as one of the uh, few options that we have when it comes to financing your education with us. Uh, okay. But I would say that as of today, ISA represents a tiny percentage of okay. um, how people are paying us. Yeah. And so are the are the majority paying by having sort of like student loans or is it installment payments? What's what's the t- what's the typical uh, yeah. that you see? Yeah. So we 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 have quite a balance uh um uh, what do you call that uh people whereby they pay themselves so we call them self pay and then uh, there are a group that it's being supported or sponsored by our hiring partners. Mm-hmm. Um, and we want our model to eventually move uh, over 70% to be on um, hiring partner sponsorship or what we call a student sponsorship program. Mm-hmm. Uh, now this, I would like to just put a bit of highlight on this. Uh, this is interesting because um, as we know, enterprises are in need of talents. But a lot of times... Uh, they might not necessarily have a sustainable talent pipeline uh, that would produce the talents uh, on a very sustainable, predictable manner. Mm -hmm. And I think where Forward School comes in is that, is to help them build that pipeline up. And so how it works is that, you know, they will sponsor our students uh, and the students will have a job guaranteed. And then basically, you know, they will sign a, a contract with our hiring partners. Uh, and they'll be able to study um, without paying a single cent. Um, okay. So so we have a number of uh, companies that's on that scheme. Mm-hmm. So they would, they would tell us, you know, uh, we are willing to you know, sponsor 10 students. Um, and then we will go look for the students, interview them, put them through an aptitude test, and then put them in front of these hiring partners as well. And so the the ultimate selection of who gets that type of scholarship is you first you do the initial selection and the screening, and then that hiring partner does the final approval of saying yes, these yes. are the ten uh, that that we're willing to sponsor. Yes, correct. Okay. okay. And of course, we we also work with ECM Libra Foundation uh-huh. uh, uh, to offer free interest loans to our uh, students uh, who are not so well to do. Mm-hmm. Um, who are in the both B40 bracket. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Inter- interesting. And out of, out of that, when, when you look at like the mix of your students, is the majority of it coming from those sort of sort of like sponsored style programs, whether the interest free loan or the corporate sponsor? Um, I would say that probably 40% are from, you know, the sponsorship. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a majority of them are actually self-paid. Um, okay. So these are, these are students that are able to, you know, pay a semester at this point in time is around 6,000 plus. Our two years program, you know, at this point in time, it's 37,500. Okay. And and so the majority uh, just pay that out of pocket. The, so I'm assuming either uh, they're working professionals and have some level of income in order to be able to finance that, or, you know, they're, they're coming from a supplement for an education where the families are putting, investing into the education. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's mostly their parents are investing mm. uh, in their education. Okay. Um, so again, because our two years program are, are mostly targeting high school leavers. Okay. So these are, these are people who are seeking an alternative pathway towards their tertiary education. Okay. Okay. And when you look at the geography of your students, so you're Penang based, but if you're doing virtual, even if they're live virtual, are the students... In Penang, are they geographically tied to where you're at or or are you able to serve a broader audience to where somebody in rural Teraganu or a different state within Malaysia, are they able to participate in those programs? Um, We are first and foremost, a, you know, we do have a physical campus. So we do encourage everyone to be in the physical campus. Mm -hmm. So that's our main uh, mode, except during uh, COVID times, okay. um, you know, it's online live. Um, and our model for scaling actually is that, you know, uh, we will want to be in, you know, major cities um, uh, in Southeast Asia, that's first. For mm-hmm. Malaysia, we will be looking into expanding to other states as well. Um, so it's very much similar to the general uh, assembly uh, model as well. Okay. And the reason why we are doing that is because uh, we feel that it is much more effective um, for us, both for the students as well as our engagement with the enterprises. Now, a, a lot of our business is about, you know, helping enterprises mm-hmm. um, and, you know, being there physically in a sense uh, allows us to engage them better. Um, and and for the students, uh Due to the audience that we serve, uh, these are high school leavers. Uh, we continue to believe that having a face-to-face interaction um, and mode of learning is still one of the most effective ways, especially when training for soft skills and as such. Okay. Um, because we don't just look at you know just the hard skills or the technical skills but we look at very much so on the soft skills as well. Okay, okay. So so t- pulling on to that aspect of the physical locations and being high school leavers, you know, when you, when you start talking about the, the geography, the distance from locations, are there any sort of like styled dormitories that you would see from a university? Is there any sort of like co-living, cohabitation arrangements that can be made for somebody that may be, you know, 30 minutes, one hour distance, may not have the transportation, especially when you start getting into the underserved communities? Yeah, yes. So uh, at least for forward school, we, we do run a co-living and co-working space as well. Um, so, so we do have companies within our space, uh, that helps in regards to the ecosystem that we are trying to build here. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a lot of our students, in fact, hundred percent of all our graduates have placements or jobs even before they graduated. Um, and the average salary that they are drawing is 3.2 for just two years of studies with us as compared to a four years degree. In regards to the dormitory, yes, we have students from out of state and, you know, then they will be staying um, um, on the second level of our building in Penang. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do have some rooms catered for mm-hmm. dormitories. 
Uh, okay. But as, as, a, as a model, um, that there is no intention for us to, you know, invest uh, too heavily on our capex. Mm. I think in regards to uh, the buildings that we have, um, you know, we we are being supported in one way or another by the community as well. Okay. Um, um, so so that's that's the direction that we are heading. Okay, so let, let's talk about the the scaling aspect because certainly one component is is that capex. Because if you're gonna ha- if you're gonna replicate physical locations each time that you look for a new city or or yeah. elsewhere, you're gonna have to replicate that. But as well, because it's in person education, you're gonna have to replicate the talent side of it. So we talked a little bit earlier uh, when when you discussed how yourself and and your partners have technical backgrounds, so it's made it easier uh, yeah. in those initial stages. How do you envision the replication of the model into other locations from a talent perspective? Yeah. So in, in the end of the day, we see ourselves uh, having a HQ and what we call a satellite schools. Um, our key and core programs uh, will be conducted in the centralized location and stream to the rest of the satellite schools. Mm-hmm. Um, so, But at the physical school in itself, the function is going to be very intentional and focused. Uh, and what we are looking at is basically tutoring. So we will have talents in each of these, um, you know, satellite schools, uh, in regards to tutors. So they will still, uh, required to check into school. Uh, they'll still be required to meet up their tutors. Uh, but in regards to, uh, you know, the core programs, it will be delivered in an online live manner, um, and there will be a centralized uh, production studio. Uh, for us to do that. So that's that's the model that we are looking at. Um, yeah. Okay. So when when thinking about executing on that model, you know, what what are what are the key things that you look at and you say, okay, these these are the specific areas that we need to execute 100% 100% spot on in order to make this effective. Being a satellite, there's a little bit there's a further distance, so control, quality control, those sort of aspects. How do you envision from a management standpoint of ensuring success um i think that's where you know uh, our lesson plans comes into play um and that's where you know our train the trainer program uh, needs to be better uh, needs to be up and running um and i think in the end of the day uh you know skilling for us is very much similar to other companies skilling uh, it's really about getting the right talent in and putting them through uh, the right training. Um, but in regards to, you know, uh, if they are far, if they are in the satellite, does it mean that they'll be missing out on certain quality? Um, I think that won't be the case. It's what I've mentioned. I think the core program will still be delivered online live to them. So they will still be receiving uh, the instructions sure. from you know yeah. our best instructors mm. where we are going to be complementing them with is with um with tutors uh, on yeah. each of these uh, satellite locations okay 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 very 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 cool very cool and so let's 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 talk about the outcome objectives yeah uh, because ultimately in order to market uh, and acquire more students they're they're going to be looking at am i going to get employment so when how do you track those sort of outcome metrics do you track number of students employed average incomes you had a reference 3.2 uh, a bit ago can you tell us a little bit about those those metrics and how uh, how perhaps that's evolved as as you've refined the model yeah I think from the get go, you know, since uh, you know, from the first day, we we see ourselves as producing programs that are, you know, em- what we call employment as a norm programs. Mm-hmm. So so all that we teach you is for uh is to prepare you to get a job. Um, um and so our entire focus is that. And so what the metrics that we track is basically average salary, 
um, and their number of students being placed in a relevant industry, which is the tech industry, mm -hmm. uh, because we you know, do not want them to be trained in tech and then you know, they work in, in another uh, industry altogether. Right. So, so that's what we looked at. And I think at this point in time, uh, it's, um, it's very encouraging. Um, I would say that um, we have ensured that every graduates, in a sense, uh, we, we have graduated two cohorts so far, and they have gone on to have fulfilling careers in tech, um, um, notably, you know, in software companies, for example, in uh, Fave, in ASPL, here in Penang, in Exabytes, in uh, Vitrox, um, so relevant uh, industries. Mm -hmm. um, and they are starting their career as as an engineer um so 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 yeah so that's that's the things that we tracked um uh, is to ensure that they have a head start uh to their tech careers that's 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 fantastic it's it's good to hear that uh that they're able to continue to move forward and and see and see that progress get placements there's much much more tech sector that continues to grow and the demand for tech talent continues to grow so i'm sure you've got a lot of work cut out for you over the coming years uh in order to be able to help fill that gap and move things forward at forward school uh, to play on the words. Let me wrap things up here with uh, with my standard closing questions, if I may. So in your in your in in managing your business, what is the one tech tool that you just can't live without? I think that would be our primary communication tool, which is Slack. Mm. So that's what we use every day um, on and off work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the amount of integrations that you can do with Slack so that it just kind of feeds across a lot of different areas of your organization. Um, last question here. So if you were to talk to another startup founder that's just getting started, what would be the one biggest piece of advice that you would offer? I would say that focus on, you know, validating your assumptions I think as founders, uh, we can be, you know, too obsessed with the ideas that we have, um, you know, too confident in regards to our assumptions and recognizing that um, you might not necessarily, you know, have the best ideas uh, and you might be bucking up the wrong tree. So I think it's extremely important for you to uh, test uh, your assumptions um, and, and test those assumptions in regards that if it is proven uh, to be uh, false, um, you know, the, the basis of your startup uh, and foundations of your startup that, that relies on. So I think it's, it's super important to get that right. Yeah. Um, and I just feel that there's a lot, a lot of founders out there might not necessarily do enough research mm -hmm. um, uh, on that front. Um, being being too attached or you know on on building things without right. uh, first and foremost validating their assumptions. Yeah, yeah, I, I I love the piece of advice because I do I do see a lot of times you get so you get so focused in the details that you can start losing uh, the understanding of the assumptions around the actual market that you're trying to serve, and honestly. And a, a a something that proves against your high, your assumption is yeah. not always a bad thing because now you have more direction. So yeah. it's it's kind of you know put on the scientist hat and constantly test assumptions, and eventually you get to where you're going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in the end of the day, you know, it is not how well you built your product. Um, you know, the product is in the end of the day. Uh, you know, is the is the is the outcome of of the idea that you have, and and you need to be, you know, solving the the right problems that many right. people share. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, that's a perfect thing to close on. You need to be solving the right problems. I I love that. Uh, thank you very much for being here, Howie. This has been a great conversation. My pleasure. Thank you, Kevin.
All right, that wraps it up for another fantastic episode of The Sea of Startups. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend, go on to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. It's the best way for us to get discovered and to have these startup stories reach a broader audience. If you have any suggestions or would like to get in touch, you can email me at kevin at indelible.vc. As always, I'm your host, Kevin Brocklin from Indelible Ventures, and this is the Sea of Startups.